so while while they're joining in, I'll say I'm I'm David Duncan. I'm a partner solutions architect, but I'm uh, and I work at Amazon, um, but I uh, worked at Red Hat first. So obviously, I've spent a lot of time around this space, and I have uh, I have been a um, a Fedora contributor for more than more than 14 years, and so uh, I feel like um, this is my first family, and definitely. A group of people that I want to make sure are having the right kind of experience around um, around the public cloud and looking at some of the things that we all run into that are complications and trying to find some ways that uh, maybe we can address those. Um, I gave a, a talk at the la the last CentOS Dojo. Um, around um, around uh, the kinds like the the kinds of things that were necessary to get from uh, from what the expectations of public cloud providers uh, service teams like just the the service teams that want to have um, you know that have big goals around what they want to bring in um, the into the into their programs, they want to they want to bring those into the operating systems like Fedora, and so we we spent well actually, you know their their goals are usually are around commercial requirements, and so they're talking about they think that they're going to go straight from uh, from from uh, start of nothing to a uh, hundred, and uh, thanks Jerry, uh, and so I you know I. Uh, they're doing great work, um, but we wanted to make sure that we were we were taking that in the right direction. So we want to go from Fedora, you know, into uh, the commercial distribution Red Hat, right? So take that from the upstream and then bring it back in. And uh, so so it's always fun to um, fun to uh, to look at how we can work together to get uh, to get that done and. Some of the things that we've done over, over, you know, over the years is to have uh, joint sponsorship around uh, different things like, um, like uh, the Cloud Init uh, uh, package. There, we usually do a summit every year that includes, you know, representatives, people who engineers who are working on, um, on the uh, on the Cloud Init, uh, come together for uh for a um for discussions obviously not in times of covid but um but in but in general and and uh there's been like a, overall uh from the perspective of of the groups that support uh open source software we, we kind of you know we know how we're gonna um we're gonna work together to make sure that we sponsor these things and don't uh don't make it a, a burden on each other so just want to uh, give everybody an opportunity to kind of ask questions, uh, talk about what goes on, and enjoy, you know, um, finding some of the things that they want in in that experience around Fedora and 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 the the CentOS, CentOS experience and um, and even Rail. Uh, so I work really closely with the Ruby team. Um, and was just praising Andre and and uh, uh, the rest of the the composer team for what they're doing uh, all with OS build and the ability to upload you know automate the upload of images. So I'm going to leave it right there. Uh, I kind of open the floor and say I'd love to have other people who are working on projects or who want to understand better how they can take advantage of um, the work that is being done around um, supporting uh, open source work and, and uh, around the these distributions, uh, which is where I spend most of my time.
Anybody have any specific questions or are they working on something? I mean, I'd love to hear about cool stuff too. I mean, that'd be great. Or we can have dead air. Well, I'll tell you some of the things that I'm I'm super excited about. So one of those is um, is uh, hibernation. Uh, that wasn't something that was in any way uh, expected. I think to be a um, a benefit on. Um, on cloud platforms, and uh, and it it really took off, but um, but not without uh, some generous help from a, sort of a community minded approach to uh, kernel requirements, supporting the swap file, um, making changes to uh, the SE Linux domain that was that uh, was necessary for writing to the swap file um, and then part of what we did in the kernel was was to uh, to work with the um, work with with the red hat team to make some upstream changes to the way that uh, uh, speed up is defined in uh, uh, queuing rights to disk and um, made some modifications to uh, the way that the swap file was written through to the NV, to NVMe devices, um, which affects you know platforms all over, and and uh, and the the ability to leverage hi hibernate in larger and larger memory uh, spaces based on the time time to uh, uh, shut down. So uh, things like that are making headway. They're changing the way that um, uh, things are going. In fact, two years ago, uh, there was a, a, a joint presentation done at Plumbers uh, to, to talk about changes in the kernel uh, that were related to hibernation and how that was a benefit to customers who were using it um, and, and uh, getting the opportunity to have a fast recovery time and to leverage spot uh, pricing for um, opportune workloads. So what about um, CLI work or um, support for uh, services? I'm really not not thinking about this from the pers I mean I'm only talking about it from the perspective of of um, of uh, AWS because that's exactly what I know. But I I still am interested, uh, you know, in how I can help to make this a better experience around Fedora, regardless of where it is that you're using it. Anybody doing any anything fun with uh, with like um, automated security? I know we have some. We have uh, we had a, there was at least one talk about building more automation around uh, some of the security profiles and and making that more automated and something that I think has been a lot of fun. So, uh, Miroslav, you you ask about EKS on AWS. Um, 
I've so there's been a, a lot of work around building up uh, support for for that uh, within the context of like building solutions out and manage nodes with with Fedora, uh, and we have a I know that there are a lot of people who use CentOS and even Rail um, for for uh, um, for their managed nodes, but um, but uh, the thing you know the thing that's really exciting to me is is uh, the Red Hat OpenShift on on AWS. Can can we get that set up? Because clearly now we are using EKS basically, but I would love to use OpenShift for my selfish reasons. So I I didn't even ask. So maybe this is a very good place to ask if if that will be possible. For example, on our Fedora CI account. Oh yeah, totally. Wow, cool. So yeah. should I reach out to you, or where should I file an issue, or how? Kevin, how flow? Kevin Finzi. Yeah. So Kevin will know. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, because we had some issues there because we are sharing the account between multiple people, multiple teams, right? That's fine. Yeah. So it, it just it, a little bit long turn turnaround when we need something, uh, but it's not not such a such a big problem. So I cool. Think I, I will. Yeah. yeah, I was just gonna say I think a lot of that came from from just not having you know so in the early days of setting up a lot of that infrastructure, um, we didn't have all the all the uh, permissions hammered out. So we were, you know, building out a better and better, more well architected system. And, and I think that that's, you know, that's something that working with, uh, with Kevin has been possible. And then there was, was a, uh, a small matter of some credentials that had been uh, pushed to GitHub and located in a very, you know, located very quickly, uh, disabled very quickly. It, Kevin, in fact, had disabled them. Um, but there, but the follow-up on the on the security review was slow, and so we had a we had a period there where we couldn't couldn't increase the number of instances that we had available or uh, make changes to the account because there was a concern about compromise, which is a good thing. I mean, I definitely want people to be looking <laughs> looking out for my uh, my best interest when it comes to security. Of course, like we are. We are encrypting our credentials and we keep it in private repos, but we are encrypting with Ansible Vault currently. But would like to love to use some Hashicorp Vault, Vault or something, at least then yeah. maybe that will be even better. But yeah, not enough time and, and not a enough expertise, this, I would say. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, team. yeah. Well, so I think I think a lot of the work that was that's been done around the identity management has has been to to establish um, uh, the SAML auth. And to use tokenized uh, credentials, and the tokenized credentials are are great because they they uh, expire pretty quickly, and uh, you know they have they have a, a defined open time, and you can you can narrow that down. Um, and for the for the automation accounts, I know that uh, Mo Brian is is rotating those, so that he he's reaching out to people and yeah, rotating the keys for automation users. Need to follow yeah. up on that. Okay, cool. So uh, you say if you say that OpenShift on AWS is possible, I will file an issue and we can follow up if what would th that take to set it up because yeah, yeah, hundred percent. It's yeah, it's a hundred percent possible, and we can we can definitely put that make that a part of the infrastructure. Awesome. One, one thing that I wanted to ask: so how, how possible is it to, for example, also have Kubert enabled there and the OpenShift virtualization? So is that is that something that we could also use? Because we have some workloads. A lot of our workloads are basically VMs. And yeah, we, VMs, we can just use EC2 instances. But still, like for some reasons, for example, for internal user and so on, we, will, we, need, we want to have capability to also use Kubert. So that's an uh, interesting yeah, question. So yeah, I, so, I, so I haven't used Kubevert myself on AWS, but I do know that you know we have instances where uh, the KVM functionality is exposed. It's just not you know supported, and uh, so so um, so it's possible. Um, and and obviously you know we have uh, our you know our our process for doing that is is typically through Firecracker. We like to get rid of the BIOS and. Take away a lot of the IO subsystems um, to make it more lightweight, but the and Kubert falls right into that, uh, you know, even into that plan. So I'd say, you know, we should look at we should look at profile some of the workloads and figure out what instances are the right ones for that. 
And, and in regards to the nested virtualization, I guess there is no nested virtualization in on EC2 instances like the virtualized virtualized ones. I need on for the metal. metal. Yeah. On the metal. Yeah, for the metal, yeah, we can we can do that. And and uh if if the workload calls for it, we can we'll figure out how to make that work. Yeah, and so. uh, yeah, a little bit selfish on the questions. Maybe others have also questions, don't want to take all your time. Yeah. No, that's good. I, I'm yeah. glad. I was I was I was actually also excited to hear your question about composer. So I use composer to build images, right? And that's uh and so for me, that was a that was an exciting thing to say is, hey, there's a community model for building images with your, you know, with the solutions that you want to and the stacks that you want to build. And so when you started talking about that, um, that's one of the things that I have uh, that, you know, is is a, like a part. It's a great part of my of of my my work process and and granted. Right. Like I. I lean towards making sure that I'm doing, you know, I'm doing work with the open source tools because that's what I'm supposed to have an expertise in. But the, but uh, Ansible is one of those things that falls right into there, right? So I'm I use I use Ansible, Red Hat Ansible, all the time for for building workloads, building out workloads, and automating uh, security security review and and uh, uh, those kinds of things for the for for the things that are in my within my responsibility. So, um, but I run into, you know, I run into these little places where I think, man, I, you know, I should spend more time, uh, developing, you know, for ans for the Ansible team, because, um, because these community modules are missing things like, like the hibernation, right. I was talking about the hibernation. And so when I first started writing up my automation for testing of hibernation, it was like, man. I've got to add that, you know, that's like, that's, that's an option I need to add to the EC2 hibernate um, or beg for, beg Jill for. So, <laughs> um, and those are, that's exactly what I was thinking about when we were, you know, we're talking about, um, or when I was talking about building this meetup was, was to think, you know, here's, there's a lot of those spots in there where uh, there's just tiny little slips around um around the support that like you get super excited about it and then you move in and you're like well, well hold on a minute i'm gonna have to do this a different way and so most of the time i uh i will go as far as i can but then uh if i if i have to pull back you know if i see that th there's something that's going to be clearly missing like i don't know i i need to define prefix lists in my security groups right or something like that with the ansible side then I'll back out and leverage uh, a CloudFormation template, um, and then and then have that CloudFormation template be deployed in the uh, from from within the Ansible stack. If we need now to automate something on AWS, use Terraform. But we are looking at Pul Pulumi, so that is like also a, a tool that is there, and it's close to Python because we do a lot of Python. So yeah, uh, any experience with with those, like. Yeah. Well, Terraform, yes. I mean, I, I've spent a lot of time with Terraform, and and uh, love the guys at HashiCorp, right? But, but the, um, uh, but like I said, you know, my my day job is supporting Red Hat on on AWS, and so I I like I like to go straight in for the Red Hat tools so that I can talk to customers about exactly how it works. But um, the. Uh, uh, but yeah, so a lot of the, you know, a lot of the base OpenShift installer, uh, work or after four, um, uh, and, and looking at, like, looking at how that works and, and, the uh, and finding little gotchas there. One of the ones that I had, so there's a, there's a Jira open on, uh, the bootstrap instance for, um, uh, for the OpenShift installer. And the reason that, that, uh, Jira is open is because uh, during the during the the last uh, half or the last couple of months of the year, we have reInvent, and in order to make sure that you know everybody can try everything they want to, as as a, as a um, as an employee, I'm uh, I make you know I help to make room for uh, for that um, you know for the for the participants to enjoy the platform um in the easiest way so uh 
one of the things they limit is our ability to, to launch an M, like an M5 instance type, right? And it just so happens that the bootstrap instances for an OpenShift installer absolutely will, will not boot on anything. You can't modify that, right? You can modify the managed node instance type or, or, the, or the management nodes, but you can't, ma you can't manage the bootstrap. And, uh, and so uh, that's one of those things that I you know, see and I'm like, ah, <laughs> under specific conditions, <laughs> this can be, this is rough. Um, yeah. And then um, another thing that I, I keep thinking about is uh, uh, network utilities. So, I think in many cases there are there are ways to use. So one of the things that I'm going to put a, a link to it in here um, is the EC2 net utils. Um, let me make sure I've got the right link because I build them in the uh, Copa repositories. Um, but this is a group of utilities that. Um, We've been talk. I've been talking to um, to Dusty about this a lot. So, uh, in the context of CoreOS, um, there's nowhere to just you can't just like tack these back on. Um, but these are UDEV rules and some and some uh, uh, some modifications to the uh, to the um, network configuration that are uh, specific to the way that. Um, Network devices are discovered and and arranged on uh, the EC2 instances, and um, it's it's not quite um, so from the, you know, it's written for or it's written with Amazon Linux in in mind. Uh, although there are lots of people who work on it, and there are pull requests that have come in from a, a number of places, um, but the SUSE team decided that uh, this didn't work, this didn't fit with their requirements, but they still wanted to, um, uh, they still wanted to be able to, to do things like uh, use the, uh, uh, the IP prefixes for uh, configuring, you know, for narrowing their, widening the scope of their network as they see fit. And then they wanted to be able to uh, add multiple IP addresses. So they built what they called the uh, cloud net config as a part of the Insulatus project, and and it is um, it's a, a place where I, I really I mean I, I feel like they did a really good job of, of pulling that together, but it's um, focused around Wicked, right? Not not Network Manager, and uh, and this is this is close to focused on Network Manager, but it's not really. The same kind of you know it's not the same tools that are being used today so i'd love to see something change there i'd love to see you know a little bit more uh dynamic support for that and then uh the same thing happens around uh volumes so it's a little bit weird um you know in the in the virtualized world um i mean from you know just just booting on kvm all the way up into the platforms where there's a whole lot of management around or plumbing around uh, how volumes are connected. The, um, the network utilities and the discovery of the devices is, uh, is a little bit more complicated than, um, than just plugging and unplugging the same device, right? The PCI IDs are different, but the volume is the same. And, um, and so I'd love to see some some more effort put in around um, getting those tools in. So talking to Dusty about it, um, uh, Dusty Mabe, we uh, somebody else uh, on the on the CoreOS team um, from the original CoreOS team, uh, Luca, was. Um, uh, was talking back and forth. He, he actually made a little utility for doing the network utilities and the and the and handling the storage devices. And uh, um, and when we talked about it, I said, you know, I, it would be great if we could push this up into System D and have just sort of a general library for cloud 
um, that was managed there. And um, and there's a there's an issue on this. I, I can't remember exactly where it is right now, but but um, uh, but Leonard said that he was open to the idea of having some of those rules for the you know for for the um, more popular options um, in System D, and I would love to see that go upstream instead of being a you know an individually maintained package with a that that doesn't have a you know an upstream test bed and and sort of get to that upstream first model. So. Yeah, interesting. I'm not much in this area. So, uh, by the way, like currently, like the OpenShift on AWS, how does that work? Does it use CoreOS? Is it how is it deployed? Yeah, yeah it does. It's a, so you're using Red Hat CoreOS underneath, and um, and it's, uh, uh, it's, I mean, it's obviously configured by the installer, so you can use the IPI or the UPI installer, um, and and you can. Uh, uh, you know, even if you're not, um, I mean, you can install it on in in pretty much every every region now, and then, um, but you can also uh, but you can also deploy it uh, to outposts. So we have some customers who have have deployed it or deployed it all the way out on the edge um, with uh, uh, with the outpost configuration and and uh, the UPI. So IPI, the the automated installer doesn't doesn't support some of the changes in the way that the subnets are defined, mm -hmm. um, but um, but with the UPI you can you can definitely do a, a solid install on the AWS outpost. Nice, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I have also maybe one thing to discuss, and it's uh, it's about snapshotting because we are, we are using OpenStack downstream mostly and we have this yeah. feature that we that we are able to quickly like like OpenStack makes it very simple to snapshot a vm and then uh, basically uh recreate that machine from that snapshot we use that to run some uh tests which break the test environment and we use this snapshot and it's like it's of course like it takes one minute or whatever uh it, it takes some time so it's not a cheap operation but still for some of the some yeah. of the tests which, which break the system and you cannot do basically anything about it it's it's something we want, and I, I when we want to implement this also on AWS because we scale out some of our workloads. I don't know if you know, not on this account, but we have a different account in AWS yeah. for REL, and we scale yeah, out hundreds. and cloud. <laughs> yeah, but but we cloud cloud burst basically from from my yeah. team, I guess. Yeah, we, we have hundreds as to uh, like a little <laughs> red, but but we cloud burst some of the or uh, some of those testing from OpenStack. If it's full, we cloud burst to AWS. We have it connected to the internal network even that we have a vpc there in north virginia and for that this use case of, of snapshotting is still not solved on our side so we don't know how to implement it because i was looking at it and it seems like in aws this is not such an easy operation as in openstack so so i mean so in openstack you've got you've got this unified storage right mm -hmm. which you don't have on the on the aws side you're <laughs> you're essentially taking a network snapshot of your device um, and, and behind the scenes, <laughs> the, uh, a, um, an incremental snapshot can be fairly quick, right? Uh, so you can take continuous snapshots, you know, just sort of rotate out snapshots. And then when you need to have a fast snapshot, you have that pre-cache and, and then your, your, your copy on write is much smaller. So you get a, effectively a much smaller, uh, snap for the, for the last one. Um, but the other thing you can do is to is to leverage LVM, and you can take advantage of LVM volumes to to do to do mm -hmm. a base snap. Um, better better idea is to have a golden image, right? And then just make sure that when you're doing your deployment, you can drop you can drop from that golden image um, pretty much any time. So, what we try to do is capture you know, the packer process is great for getting started, but then you have this continuous process and you have some specific uh, instances that you want to bring up fast. So, so usually that's, that's what we do is we, we tend to have, we expect fail only architecture. 
So if I have a running VM and I want to snapshot it, or or maybe you, can I use that hibernation for it? And I want to basically recreate recreate it from that snapshot later on, and the IP should stay the same. Is that possible? Well, I don't know about from the from the hibernate side. <clears throat> you're going to lose your swap, right? When you mm -hmm. when you okay. snapshot it, but because you're not going to be on the same hardware, right? Mm -hmm. And and there's no guarantee that you'll have you'll you'll be, have the, exactly the same footprint, right? But <clears throat> but for um, but for an instance, like if you if I decide that I want, so let's say I'm I'm messing around and I know that I want what I've got point in time uh, on the instance that I have today. The the fastest way to do what you're talking about is through the LVM and to create a snapshot and have sort of a double sized volume and the volumes themselves. If, if you get to a point where you think that this is the right, you know, this is the right size volume, you snapshot that volume, you extend it, you create the LVM size that will, that will work for uh, your fast snapshot. You do your fast snapshot. And if you need to throw away the whole machine and start it back up with the with the right size, the the right size snapshot, because you know it's XFS. You don't want to shrink it. Okay. I need to try it out. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, but the the uh, like a logical volume for a specific for you know for specific mount points is probably a, a great way to go, and then and then just leverage that. Uh, um, and the AMI process is, is, you know, is always better. Like if, you, if you can create a machine image instead of just creating a snapshot, uh, that's usually my, my, my preference there is that, you know, you, you grab that machine image and then the machine image is consistent metadata and all. Mm -hmm. um, the snapshot itself doesn't, doesn't necessarily carry with it the billing, like the billing identifier. So if you've got, Let's say you're using, you want to use the Rui, and mm -hmm. um, and there's a, you know, there's Rui in all sorts of in lots of clouds, and and uh, you want to use the Rui, you're you're usually bound to identi specific identifiers um, for that for the machine images or the images that are being used um, to pull those instances, and then you have to make sure that all of that is is consistent. Creating an image seems that is what we, what we basically want. Yeah. Anybody else? Looks like we just we just get to have our own our own conversation. <laughs> Anything else you're working on that's been? Uh, what's... I don't know. I, well, I wanted to ask about the current quota setup, like what are the limits? Because like we are hitting now, like doing a lot of federal CI testing lately, and it will go up. So I'm I'm just I'm I, I, I'm as as I'm not the administrator of the account, I'm not even watching like what we are doing there. So I just well, wanted to ask what what, what are the yeah what should be our well, expectations. Cool uh -huh. Right. So the cool thing is is that you have a you have what's called a personal health dashboard, and and you can. Uh, and Kevin can extend you access to the personal health dashboard and you can get that content um, from uh, uh, from the command line. So you can bring the personal the, you can bring the metrics from that personal health dash dashboard into something that is consumable by you. And so you can see where you are in terms of that. But sometimes it's sometimes it's not about uh, quotas. It's about capacity. So you may see that, you know, you, you find yourself running up against limits. I mean, it's good to run up against limits. Um, and then the next thing there is that there's an automated, uh, there's a, an automated customer service um, mm -hmm. request that you can make. And you can, so you can put in an automated service, customer service request for a limit increase when you have time. And when you don't have time, you know, you can, uh, uh, you can hit me up. We'll, we'll talk about it. So, yeah. you know, 
Um, Currently, we didn't have any issues. Like there was this just these spot instances as, as we were enabling spot instances because basically for all of the CI testing we can just use spots, right? But we didn't because it didn't work, right? So, so yeah. spot instances, yeah. And I, I know that we are we're hitting there some limit because it's like all the limit is on the whole account. So we had like hundred fifty. Yeah, account. that well, so yeah. so that spot instance issue was directly related to um, the open case on the on the. Uh, credentials that had been discovered in GitHub. And and so once, I can't believe how, how long that took. So it literally, the case, uh, the case hadn't been touched in so long that it had fallen off of the, you know, it fallen off of the dashboard. Mm -hmm. It took us a while to figure out where it was. Well, finally, uh, you know, we were talking, I think Kevin was talking to someone in threat management and and they said, you know, they wanted to, they wanted to know, um, about this, this open case. And he was like, I, I, I thought I'd, I thought I'd handled that, but clearly, you know, like, like we didn't, we didn't agree on that. And so, so then he went back and handled it. And now we're, we're actually able to make those, the, the changes and the limit increases, um, that are necessary to, to support the workloads. Awesome. Yeah, I need to, I need to set that up because, like, currently we are using, I think, not spot, not spot instances, and I would rather use spot instances and then fail over to using non-spot ones. So we are able right. to do. That. Right. Yeah, and uh, have you looked at launch templates too? Is it uh, not yet? No, we, we, have, we have our own provisioning system. We have a presentation about it tomorrow that we use for that failover and cloud bursting from from OpenStack uh -huh. AWS. So we have that baked in somehow, so we don't use launch templates much we directly using but you use a kind of kind of a similar it sounds like you're using a similar kind of um model though like it's the structure yeah. of it yeah we, we have some golden images so we have prepared CI, special images which have already baked in ci stuff which i built actually with packer because like we have ansible playbooks that's why i was yeah yeah about always, always yeah no I, yeah yeah the the so packer was a so the interesting thing about packer is that you have that option to sideload things and sideloading for for um with a with a packer configuration can uh separate the snapshot from the from the instance itself and then reassign that and if a customer is using a, a metered billing like they're using an hourly price uh instance so one of the things that they may run into that you won't run into because you're using um uh you're you're probably using just a standard, uh, just standard instance with uh, with a cloud access in, uh, image. Uh, is that is that when you separate the the uh, snapshot from the metadata of the east of the machine image, that the billing product code doesn't necessarily follow the uh, snapshot until later, <laughs> and then. <laughs> And then if you if you you know like if you do mix things like root root volume swap or something like that, you may have to go back and review what it is you know what the the provenance of your of your snapshot to ensure that you're not um, you're not getting a, a, a different billing code reassigned on top of the ones that are appropriate. Very interesting. Yeah, I, like currently we do the building in uh, internally in OpenStack, and we just sync then the calls from OpenStack to AWS, so that's what we are doing. Uh, but yeah, I, I wanted to yeah. look into building directly on AWS, but uh, we don't do it now. So, but well, look at yeah. yeah, yeah, look at the composer. So that, that's another thing is is the so the image builder uh, um, or OS build supports a lot of a lot of that build process through uh, through the state the same the 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 same kickstarts we're, we're leveraging to create the machine images through the uh, through the group. So like Brian Stenson uses those for the CentOS images and Dusty uses them for the cloud images. And that's, and that's, uh, uh, that's expected. And uh, although I don't think either one of them, I don't think they're using OS build right now, but, <clears throat> but the, but the process is the same and they're leveraging the same kickstarts. Um, and you might be able to you might be able to to to, to uh, sneak sneak a lot of the things you need in in there um, before build. Thank you. Thank you. 
Yeah. So cool. Well, I think I think we can call it. I don't think we got any more questions. And um, thanks for joining me. Appreciate yeah, that. Of course, for thanks for answering my questions. Really glad and thanks. Yeah. Thanks for everything. Yeah, absolutely. Nicola, thanks. Thanks for uh, for proctoring here and making this really easy. Oh well, uh, actually, the, the like the whole team that is working behind us is helping us a lot and helping me a lot as well. I wanted to thank you for uh, this nice conversation that you had. I didn't really get much of what you said, but I think it was interesting for the people who were into the topic because, I mean, um, yeah. Well, I mean, Miroslav is talking almost immediately about a lot of the Fedora infrastructure that we, you know, that has been, we've built out on AWS over many years and, and, uh, and supports things like Coper, the Coper builds and a lot of the uh, continuous integration. And so we want to make sure that that runs uh, really well. That wasn't necessarily exactly what I wanted was, you know, was hoping to talk about. I was hoping that we'd have a, little, a few more people who wanted to talk about their you know, their cloud journey and, and to, and to discuss some of the pain points that we've all experienced together, but, um, or some of the joint, you know, a lot of the things that we, I think we've done that are, that are joint, um, uh, jointly, um, lifting for the community, right? Like sponsoring the cloud and it, uh, uh, group for, uh, support or, uh, getting together to, you know, for, for specific cloud summits around uh, different technologies that we all share and, uh, and seeing how those are supported. So ha had a very celebrated career doing this and have gotten to meet a lot of people in open source from a lot of different places. And, uh, and it's been, uh, it's been a beautiful, beautiful, you know, uh, career and journey around um around that experience so just want to share make sure that we all get to do it oh well if you want to share more you have still 10 minutes and if you oh, want to share maybe some contacts or um some resources for maybe some people that are in the chat or that are uh just uh, reading this yeah. later or seeing this later to reach back to you maybe or even today or in the next days, uh, just feel free to write whatever you want here. Awesome. And because because I think that, um, I mean, as, as far as I saw it, um, there are people interested in talking, but people are still very shy to join uh, live conversations, right? So maybe they just need some time to um, um, right. un understand and, and have the courage to, to reach back to you. Cool. Yeah, I will put some things in the in the chat there, but Yuri, so it looks like you've you got your microphone off off mute. Am I saying? Yeah, that? I thought I will use my second moderator privilege to jump in because I have some experience with Becker, and I was wondering when do you trigger an image rebuild when you are using Becker for our infrastructure? Is it something that you prefer to do manually, or every time something changes in a repository? which then means you have to have separate repository for each image, which is quite impractical. Oh, but if you don't trigger it, then you can keep accumulating changes. And then when you trigger the build after a week or so, then you figure out the build doesn't work and you don't know which comment broke it. So do you have, have experience with situations like these? Well, so I know that a lot of the, so I know that there's a lot of work that's been done around this with EKS. And, and the EKS team keeps those Packer uh, scripts um, sort of collectively. Um, uh, personally, I spend, you know, I don't spend as much time with, with Packer. I don't spend enough time with Packer to, to, to have it integrated deeply into my build process. Um, I'm using, I'm using Composer, right? So, so the, um, the, uh, the composer CLI ends up being the part, the place where I do all of my, my building. Um, the, but I, I understand what you're saying. It is, it does get complicated. And I would say that, uh, I don't know that, I, I don't know. I just don't know. 
don't know if you're, I don't know the answer to your question. And, and I think it has to do with the process. Miroslav, do you have, you have something to say yeah, about for that? For us, what, what we do now, and it's like currently a prototype because we are taking over the process of image generation for L, and we have basically Ansible playbooks which set up the machine, and we are we have we are using Ansible also to template all the releases that we support. And uh, once the uh, new we want to update the new nightly, we just basically rerun the image generation and rerun some processes to get the image in incorporated into the CI. So that's that's what we are. But we don't have any CI on top of that, just to make sure that the Installation process doesn't break on all the systems that we basically support, but it's definitely a good point to have. But currently, like I don't have so much experience that I would see any problems there. This is just where we are heading using Packer together with Ansible and uh, basically creating those Packer uh, Packer definitions from Ansible uh, templates. Yeah. You know, Ooh. so they're templating. Yeah, do do maybe ever do like two level Packer builds. Like let's say you have some base image, then you build on top of that some other image and on top of that another image because my one scenario that I experienced was installing Visual Studio on Windows virtual machine takes really long. And if it becomes part of every build from like the grounds up, it becomes uh, horrible. <laughs> Very slow. We are using QCows directly that uh, the, the release team of RHEL uh, produces QCows and we take that as an input that you give it directly to Packer and just we just do one one layer basically which is set up with those Ansible playbooks that I talked about. So that's what yeah. we do. We don't do multiple, multiple stages. The one one layer is completely enough for us for our usage. Yeah. I know the company that gave me this shirt uh, was uh, was responsible and uses a lot of RHEL. Uh, um, was responsible it does a lot of the that layered building um for their for their configuration so they expect to have they expect to have a uh, a lot of um uh, you know a lot of configuration requirements but all of them are incremental so and that's where the that's where the side build that i was talking about here is it becomes a becomes complicated uh, because if you separate out, so if you deconstruct the machine image from snap, you know, from the EC2 uh, AMI to met, meta, you know, the EC2 just deregister the snapshot from the from the image and then re-register it, you run the risk of removing things like billing product codes that are assigned from the Rui team uh, or or uh, or that kind of you know things of that nature and and same thing for the Windows instances for the for the Windows instances you can decouple uh, the registered uh, metadata from the from the snapshot and then when you re-register it if it was you know if it had metered billing associated with it then that metered billing can be uh, in a complicated way lost um, eventually it'll be re-established but it's not immediate. But cool. Yeah, that's a great question. And great answer, Miroslav. I appreciate that. Thanks. Okay. I will have to run. So thanks very much yeah. again. See you. Cool. Yeah. So I added in the Cloud Net config project. That's another, that's one of those great projects, I think, that uh, um, doesn't get enough credence. And then that that whole team, this this uh, you know, the SUSE team that works on this this um, the SUSE Insulatus uh, project, they've done some really, really fun things. And, and these are, uh, they include um, some utilities for uh, import and export of images or, uh, or modification of images based on uh, migration, snapshot migrations. And another one of my favorites is their image utils. Um, and they have them, they have them, uh, 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 thanks Tomash for being here. And uh, they have that, those image utilities um, built so that they, they can um, take a configuration that a customer has uh, for like a virtual machine that they're using on VMware or KVM or whatever. And they can just uh, point to the machine image that they want it to be associated with they will bring the snapshot up, copy the contents onto the from one root FS to another, and then that 
uh, the file systems will uh, will connect and or, or will, uh, copy, and then you'll have an image with, that is associated with the operating system that you expected it to be, and potentially you persist metered billing in a consistent way. And it's really cool. It's all written in Python, so it's a lot of fun to read. Um, and uh, and um, great, great part of our open source community. Uh, and then all of their, they have like all the things they use for um, their image stream. Uh, that also is is uh, um, is published, and and their uh, the tools they had for they have uh, built around that are all named after they have beer names, beer associated names. So their uh, their information tracking tool for their uh, for their images to find a, a specific image or a region ser regional server that that serves updates like their CDN. They uh, it's named Pint. You know that the, the track that information name tracker is called Pint, right? So, and all their all of the stuff that they uh, their their um, image uh, validation software that they use for determining whether or not systems are running correctly on different images is called uh, the IPA uh, image proof. But it's uh, yeah, but but it's IPA, and you've got the Pint tool and IPA and those tests and and take care of the images. Anyway, 